you're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews. How are you all? Are you okay? Why do these things always happen to me? So it was dentist time this week. Real, real delight. I can't tell you. I don't like going to the dentist. My fear is always that the dentist or the hygienist is going to drop something while they're working on my mouth and it go down my throat. That is my fear. I've got to be honest with you. And so normally I put a podcast on or something to listen to. And the one that I put on was one that I hadn't heard before. And it was only partway through. I thought this is the worst thing I can hear. The pain of listening to this podcast is almost like the pain of not having anything to listen to and worrying even more. But the dentist was very good and said, I'm going to suggest the hygienist that we put on this thing that just makes you less sensitive. It'll last about a month. You can't drink for half an hour afterwards. Deal, deal. Great. Hygienist does it. Super. Don't drink for half an hour. No, that's fine. I'll be driving anyway, so that's fine. Um, So I made sure it was over an hour till I had a drink. I was in the office. I had meetings. Busy, busy. That was fine. Had a drink. All good. Um, At the end of the day, I came home from the office and saw my family and my family said, good grief. What is that on your teeth? And I looked in the mirror and it looks like, you know, when you've eaten one of those really, I don't know, stodgy sandwiches, you get bits of sandwich. Maybe it's just me between all your teeth. It's They didn't warn me. They didn't warn me that when you've done this, you should then after a while maybe pay some attention to how your mouth is looking because it looks like I don't I can't even describe it. You know, in weird programs where there are weird neighbours who have sellotape around their glasses, skin peels off their face and they've got these weird teeth. That's how my teeth were looking. Why? Why doesn't anyone warn me about this? I'm too busy to gaze in the mirror. Well, anyway, who would I wouldn't want to gaze in the mirror. But do you know what I mean? It just, oh, dear. So so there we go. That's my news. Um, But forget about that, because I have got some brilliant books to talk to you about. Quite a range, um, but just brilliant. I can't wait. You you, hopefully you're going to find something here that you love. Um, So the first one is Miss Aldridge Regrets by Louise Hare. Then we've got Silence is Not an Option by Stuart Lawrence. We've got The Cutting Season by M.W. Craven. We've got Two Years Indoors by Simple Politics. And then finally, we've got How to Kill Your Family by Bella Mackey. As I say, it's a selection and they're all stonkers, so you should love them. But first of all, well, we've got the main interview with Louise Hare. But before we go to that, we're going to do the quick five in five section. Now, this I'm rambling, but this is exciting. So Silence is Not an Option is written by Stuart Lawrence. Stuart is the brother of Stephen Lawrence, who was... um, murdered in a racially motivated attack um, coming up to it's nearly 30 years now and on April the 22nd it's Stephen Lawrence Day um, as we remember and as we work together to try and make sure this awful thing doesn't happen again. Uh, And this book Find Your Voice is well let me read you the blurb first. Um, From role models to self-control, failure to imagination, Stuart uses his own experience to help young people, to help all people harness the good in themselves and in the world around them, using that fire of positivity to create change in their lives. This is a book, really, it's supposed to be um, sort of from age 10 to 16, that sort of range. But I would I found real benefit from reading this book. It makes you understand more about yourself and how to work with others, um, what to base success on. Um, it's about respect. It, it's it's just wonderful. I think if you've got a child who well, whether they're going through it or not, it's a great book to have. I think schools should have this in their libraries. Um, I thought it was Yeah, really good. What's the first sentence? The first sentence. Introduction. We all want to be successful in life and to be remembered for our achievements. But how can we do that when the world can seem so big and sometimes scary? 
Well, let's go to the five and five now. So Stuart Lawrence, whose book is Silence is Not an Option, welcome to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you tell me a little bit um, about the book? Yeah, sure. So the book uh, covers a number of different topics that I find that will help young people to be the best version of themselves. And I, in all the years of me school teaching, being a form tutor was some of the best parts of, of that experience for me. And it's that in those times as a form tutor, we'd have those other conversations about life and what's going on in the world and future aspirations and how you're going to get there. And what I realised was that there were certain key elements and points that I needed young people to understand about and get their heads around and get to grips with. And the quicker they could get their, their heads around and understand it, the more successful they became. So for me, I was like, right, can I just put it in a book? Can I encapsulate it to help all young people? And what's really great about the book is, well, it's not a cover to cover read. You can dip in, dip out. There may be topics or issues that you may be facing at the time. You go, oh, how can I, what can I do? How can I get through this? And that's what the book's there for, is to give, to give you another side or another voice to something and then for you to go off and to question and to find other adults that you can maybe say do you know what I'm going through this and I think this and what do you think and get their point of view or get their advice about something which hopefully will give them a more rounded understand about the topic rather than sometimes that negative voice that we can have in our head that tells us no we can't or no we shouldn't Um, and that's what I find that stops children sometimes reaching their full potential. And the book is coming is out in April, which is um, that month has a particular, obviously, a particular meaning for you with Stephen Lawrence Day on the 22nd of April. Um, can you tell me more about that day? Yeah, definitely. So t- the 22nd of April every year is the Stephen Lawrence Day and it has been since 2019. So we're in our third or fourth year now. And due to the pandemic, it's been really difficult to really celebrate that day. And we've been digital for the last two years. But this year, we're really hopeful that we can make a big splash. You know, we can go out there into schools, into communities and also get businesses to to, to sign up and to also pay their part and help celebrate the day, really. And the day is all about ensuring that young people have all the tools, all the resources, all the avenues to do whatever they want to do whatever that may be and and it's for us adults to hope hopefully help facilitate that really because i mean it's hard for to imagine it's nearly 30 years ago when your brother was murdered i mean it's extraordinary yeah yeah so next year we 30 years and yeah you know i was saying to my wife last night we were talking about a trip that we went to 10 years ago to, to ireland and i was just like where does time go how does it always seem to disappear so quickly and that's something that we talk about in the book about you know i say to young people all the time that's a concept that the older you get the more you understand how precious that commodity is mm-hmm. and how you know even the richest people in the world who would love to be able to pause rewind you know time go back change things they can't it's just one commodity that we wish we could control more of and have more say so about but we can't so therefore we really need to make the most of today that's my one of my key messages to young people make the most of today and if anything doesn't go so well today you don't quite you know have the outcomes that you want let's hope and pray that you get one more day to try and put those things right and if you do then you do get that every day then try your hardest just to make sure you don't make the same mistakes you made yesterday and make a better choices today and, and that's what life's about surely uh, can you describe your book in three words? Oh, three words. I definitely would say insightful. The way I would like to see it, for people to see it, is it's that scenario of a, of a caring adult that gives you a hug. That's what I'd like to, for it to be seen as. And fun. I'd like to, for people to know the book is fun as well. It's, it's not all about, you know, trying to make you do things. There's also some fun bits in there because, again, uh, we're all different human beings, all bespoke human beings, and... I hope you can find an element of fun inside there as well and, and allow you to be yourself, I hope. And what's been the best moment since writing the book and uh, having it published? What's the, the best time? Yeah, so I've had a couple, really. So the the, the two I'd like to, to reference is I went to do, I did a talk for World Book Day uh, in a school in um, down by the South Coast. And I was there for the whole day. I had lunch and we went to the library. And I was in the library just before setting up for my second session. And this young lady came up to me. She said, oh, do you know what, Stuart? Thank you, because you've allowed me to understand that I'm OK to be myself at school. And she was an autistic child. 
And, and that's what I find with, with my book. It really talks to those children that may be f- struggling with little bits of themselves, understanding where they fit in. And th- that's what I say to young people all the time. It's, it's not about you being a, a like someone else. It's someone else going, I accept you as you. And, and, as, and you, however you come, whatever you're about, I accept you as you and you accept me as me. That's what we really need to try and get to the essence of with young people. So that's the first thing. And, and then the second thing was was another young child who was autistic as well, who was struggling around the sense of competition. And you get really frustrated when you play computer games because you're like, I'm not winning. I'm not the best. But the book talks about that. It's not about competing against other people. It's about competing with yourself. So as long as you're playing the game and you got better since the yesterday or the last time you played it, then that's progress. And that's all we need to see. I don't need you to be the next gaming star. I just need you to know that progression happens every day. Small steps make us be able to climb that big mountain that sometimes seems impossible to climb. Wow, that's that's amazing. No wonder the book shines this brilliant light because uh, clearly you're a brilliant light yourself. Oh, but, thank uh, you. I appreciate Stuart that. Lawrence, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Very powerful. So that's Find Your Voice by Stuart Lawrence. And now let's go on to the next book. So this one is a fiction book, Miss Aldridge Regrets by Louise Hare. You will have heard of Louise. She wrote the book This Lovely City. Um, And this one is set. Well, let me read you the blurb. London, 1936, the Queen Mary. Lena Aldridge is fleeing from danger and heading to New York for her fresh start. But someone is making manoeuvres behind the scenes. And Lena has been cast in the leading role. All the players are assembled and there's only one thing on their mind. Murder. I really enjoyed this book. It was so evocative. Um, The fact, you know, it felt a bit like um, death on the Nile, but it's not at all. You you know, just all these, these characters contained on a boat and what's happening and what's going on and the intrigue and the different layers. And then you hear this narration coming in at times from somebody and you don't know who it is uh, but you know that they're up to no good and uh, yeah I thought uh, great book Um, so let's talk to Louise now. So Louise Hare author of Miss Aldridge Regrets welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well so keen to talk to you what a book I mean following on from your hugely successful book in 2020 this lovely city what made you want to write this book now so it started off a little bit the same as the sylvie city in that i was doing a master's in creative writing and they kept basically making me write short stories which i'm not very good at um so both books started as short stories um that people liked the criticism when we did it critique it in class was good but everyone said these aren't short stories because we want to know what happens to the characters afterwards. So um, it was a bit the same with Miss Aldridge in that um, I'd written this short story set in a a jazz club in Soho um, about a singer who witnesses a murder. And at the end of that story, she is heading off and she's like, I'm getting out of London. I'm going to, going to sail to New York. And so that was sort of the idea um, because as soon as you put someone on a ship, everyone's like, Oh, what's going to happen on the ship? And, there's already been a murder. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so that's how it sort of began. Wonderful. And so did all the elements then come pretty quickly or was it? did it take time to get all the concept and the ideas and how the story would pan out? Yeah, so I spent a few months sort of thinking about the different elements. Um, so the, the book is set, um, a lot of it's set on the Queen Mary, which is obviously quite an iconic ship of the time. It's set in 1936. Um so it was, it was more doing research. At one point I was going to make, sort of invent my own ship and sort of fictionalise um, <laughs> an ocean liner. But then as I was doing the research, I was like, but the Queen Mary is so good um, and, and such an iconic ship. You know, most people have, have heard of the Queen Mary. So it just seemed like um, it was going to be, A, much easier to just use um, <laughs> the ship that existed because there was so much information out there about her. Um, and uh, yeah, and also I love the glamour. Like I love... I love watching, um, like a, you know, rainy Sunday afternoon, sitting in front of a, a Poirot on the telly. So it mm. sort of reminded me of of those. And was there any of all the research that you did? Was there any particular piece of historical information that just made you sort of stop in your tracks and think, 
God. I guess it was quite interesting because obviously the late 1930s or sort of the mid 1930s was an interesting time anyway because you had, you know, Hitler was in power in Germany and so there were things going on that were quite interesting to contrast with what was happening in, in the world uh, back in 2019 when I was writing this and actually obviously, you know, still now if you think about Ukraine. Um, but then, mm. you know, doing the research about the Queen Mary was really interesting. Um, I was reading about, there's a great book written by this uh, guy who was like a crew member um, right from the beginning from her maiden voyage. Um, and some of the stories that he's got in his book, you know, that they were like professional, he calls them courtesans. Oh, it's probably a, a nice a nicer way <laughs> of, of putting it. But yeah. they, you know, they would travel in like first class, you know, and but they would make so much money on, on these crossings because there were a lot of wealthy gentlemen who maybe wanted some company. Um, so, so yeah, some people used to actually work, but not in an official capacity on the ship. And there were quite a lot of um, professional gamblers and stuff as well. So those sort of things, that sort of seedier side mm. of the glamour was quite interesting. Oh, yeah, fascinating. And we meet Lena Aldridge, the, the main character of the book. Did she come to you fully formed with her backstory? A little bit, actually. I, I found her really easy to to write um she's just a really fun fun character to write um and yeah once I just started thinking putting myself into her shoes I mean the original short story that I wrote I just was thinking about you know when you go to um a club or a, or a musical or to a play and you see these people up on stage um acting and singing and you just sort of think oh they've got it all together you know but what we always then I was thinking, what yes. happens when people come off stage? Because they're just normal people. So I sort of had this idea of writing this character who seems so together, but actually is an absolute mess. <laughs> um, which <laughs> Lena is essentially. And but that's quite fun to, to write and to explore. And it's such a captivating story. I was wondering whether it really stayed with you afterwards, even when you'd finished. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the good thing is it so it's going to be. Um, well, I, I say a series. There's going to be at least one more book with Lena because that's what I'm writing at the moment. Oh, great! So it sort of hasn't left me because I'm still, you know, still writing what happens next. Um, so, you know, obviously this with Nostalgia Regrets, I'd I'd say I was definitely trying to follow the model of that sort of traditional golden age mystery, mm. and then the second one is a little bit different. Um, partly because it'd just be really unfortunate if she just kept tripping over dead bodies because <laughs> she's not a detective <laughs> or anything. Um, so it has been a bit of a, a different process. Um, but yeah, there's just so much that I enjoyed about writing um, Miss Aldridge Regrets and I'm really glad to be revisiting um, some of the more interesting characters, those mm. that who, who survived. <laughs> so did you know when you were writing um, Miss Aldridge that there would be definitely be a second book or was it only as you were writing that you thought oh hang on there's more to tell no I mean I, I completely wrote it as a, as a standalone novel and it was only about a year ago um when we were sort of pitching it to US publishers um and one of the editors was really interested but she said well I'd only really be interested if it was a series because I feel like there's more material here that you mm. could use and in like a 20 minute conversation, we'd already come up with a couple of different ideas for, for novels. So I was like, actually, yeah, that's really exciting. And, you know, as I, as I was saying, it was such fun to write Lena that I, I was really ha like, I was really happy to sort of go back and, and, and write something more with her in. Yeah, that's great. Um, another thing I loved about the book is the twists and the turns. I don't want to give anything away, but did you know when those were going to be or did they surprise you as you yeah, were writing Yeah, I'm not it? a huge planner. Um, <laughs> I try and have in my head a few things that need to happen and by what point they need to happen. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I can't really say what they are. <laughs> yeah, no. Really spoiling, but, yeah, there's a couple of big things that happen, <laughs> which, which I knew were going to happen. And it was just working out, you know, how and, and, and when exactly. But, for example, the first draft has a different murderer because oh. I started the book going, OK, it's this person. But then by the time I got to the end... I realised that there was a, a character who had a, a stronger motive and it made more sense. And actually it didn't take that much editing for me to change it to that person. So I was like, okay, that's definitely the right decision because it does make a lot more sense to me now. Oh, wow. 
I'm intrigued by that. I'll have to think about that one. Um, for me, the book has so much. <laughs> it's got it's about identity, race, class, um, murder, death. Was it hard getting the balance just right? Yeah, I, as I said, I don't really plan, which is it's sort of an issue at times, but um, it does. I do find it a more enjoyable process to just sort of sit down and go, okay, what should we what should we do today? Um, I mean, one good thing with this book is because you've only got four days, so it's quite a tight time frame, mm. which helps, you know, to sort of keep me disciplined. But, um, but yeah, I just had to try to have fun with it, and things sort of happened um, generally when I needed to. I was just sort of like, oh, I've, I've got to sort of 40,000 words, I maybe should kill someone off at this point. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, who? <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I do try and set some guidelines for myself so it doesn't get out of control but um generally um I think I was just kind of lucky that it, it sort of worked first time mostly and let's talk about the audiobook because it's narrated by Georgina Campbell who's been in Broadchurch and Black Mirror um it it's a brilliant audiobook I think and in fact we've got the very beginning of chapter one just a minute to to play and this is literally the start of chapter one so it, as you said it's 1936 and we're on the Queen Mary so let's listen to this now. I stared down into the churning water wondering how long it would take for an object to strike the surface if it fell from such a height. I had found a spot at the quieter end of the promenade deck several stories above the fierce white capped waves. Opening my hand I let the bottle fall, holding my breath as it began to spin, almost hitting the side of the boat. Small and brown, the bottle looked ordinary, but its contents were lethal and I welcomed its demise, destined to sink until it came to rest on the floor of the English Channel. I felt a weight lift and wipe tears from my cheeks as my body sagged forward over the railing my legs shaking. For days I had carried death with me and finally I was free of it. Wow. <laughs> it's wonderful to hear. Is it nice for you to hear that? Yeah, because I've not actually heard it before. <laughs> um, so obviously I've heard Georgina's um, doing other things. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's quite, yeah, it's, it's always so bizarre listening to um, the audiobooks of my novels because they don't, like they, I don't feel like that connection with them for some reason. They they sound like I'm listening to someone else's book. <laughs> so that's the audio book as well, which which is will be available. Now, let's just talk about writing generally. How, how do you get ideas? Is it purely what you're doing as short stories as part of your uh, the, the course that you're doing, the studying that you're doing? So that's how the first two um, novels sort of began. Um, and then obviously I'm, I'm writing another Lena book. Um but yeah, it can be it can be from different sources because um, I write historical fiction mostly. Um, so I, I've been trying to get some ideas from from actually going through um, and studying Black British history because there's so many interesting characters, um, you know, mm -hmm. going back over hundreds of years. So um, I have been sort of working on and off on a, a novel set in the 1760s which does have, uh, it's sort of based very loosely around a, a real story. Um, it's not quite right yet, so I'm going to have another crack at it. But um, that's been really interesting, a really interesting process to research as well, because up until now, I've mostly been sticking with 20th century, which is a little bit easier to research, because um, you can watch old movies and you can, you know, there's so much information about life at that time. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah, I, I mean... So, yeah, I, I can go and sit for an afternoon in the library, but I couldn't do it. You know, I couldn't be a historian and sit there every day. Um, I, I get bored <laughs> quite easily. Um, so I like to sort of have multimedia research. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I've got quite a few different ideas <laughs> for stuff. It's just finding, I guess, just finding time to um, think, sit and think about them and sort of flesh them out into a, you know, a full story. And I was interested because your first book, This Lovely City, has done so well. You know, everyone's talked about it. It's been on um, TV programmes, all sorts. Was that a help when you came to write the second book? Did it give you more confidence or did it actually 
hinder your ability to immerse yourself? Yeah, I was very lucky that um, very soon after I signed um, my publishing deal, um, I was talking to a, a debut author who was a, a bit ahead of me, so her book was coming out in 2019. And she advised me, because she was struggling with her second book, um, to write to try and write at least a first draft before The Sylvia City came out, which is what I did. So actually the first draft of Miss Soldier's Regrets was written in 2019. Oh. And I think that was brilliant advice because I think, it, you know, when you... And I try not to read reviews, but sometimes you do stumble across them. And it can be... You know, it can, it can be distracting when you're trying to write something. So if someone says, oh, I didn't like this aspect. And then you're like, oh, gosh, that's <laughs> that's the focus of the next book. Or, you know, something like that. You, you know, you could really <laughs> care, you know, pushed off track. So, um, so, yeah, so I was really glad that I followed that advice. So I didn't have any of those mm. issues, thank goodness. Is there anything you wish that someone had told you about writing before you got started? I think at the beginning, um, and I think... It's just a pitfall that a lot of historical fiction writers have fallen into at the beginning is I felt like I had to research everything right at the beginning before I could start writing. And actually, that just it just meant that I didn't actually really write more than a couple of pages for six to nine months, which... Um, and, and a lot of that research was, you know, useless because you, you do so much research and then you try and think, oh, how can I best use all of this stuff that I've learned? Um, but actually what's most important is the story. So figure out what the story is and then do the research to sort of fit around around that rather than trying to make a story fit the research. So, yeah, I probably could have saved about, probably about 18 months <laughs> um, on that very first novel, which is still in a drawer somewhere. You know, it's good practice. I guess that's what, another thing to think about is your first novel might not do anything, but that's fine. It, you know, it's just getting into good habits and learning and then hopefully with novel two or novel three you know yes. you you've learned enough that you can sort of you know write something that's then publishable and h- how did you get your first deal your your agent your publisher yeah so with that novel that's in the drawer I'd I did eventually finish it um sent it out to around <laughs> 50 literary agents um who all rejected it um but a few, a handful liked it. Um, so they read the, the, the full manuscript um, and gave me really good feedback and explained exactly why they, they, didn't want, you know, they wouldn't sign me for that novel, um, which was really interesting. Oh. And also, in a weird way, encouraging, even though it's a rejection, it's sort of like mm. a positive um, rejection. Um, and yeah. one of the last ones was um, an agent called Nell Andre. And I knew that she was a judge on the Lucy Cavendish Fiction Prize at the time. Um, and I'd just started writing this lovely city. So I was sort of thinking, oh, should I just send that in? Because the great thing with the Lucy Cavendish Fiction Prize is that you don't need to have a full manuscript. It's, it changes slightly every year, but I think at the time it was 40 pages and then like a full synopsis oh. of what was going to happen in the rest of the book. And I had like 20 pages. So I had a mad week where I just tried to get words on a page just to literally hit the sort of um, minimum page number requirement. And I sent it in and then I ended up getting shortlisted. Um, And to be shortlisted meant that you had a a meeting with Nell. And then she just went, yeah, I remember your first book. Let's do it. So that was kind of how it it happened so you know weirdly at that point I hadn't even finished the first draft wow. so perseverance hard graft and g- sensing an opportunity yeah I think you know it's hard it's trying to get published and to, and to get it you know these things are not easy um so you just got to keep going I think <laughs> and there is still you've got to get used to rejection because it's just going to keep happening like even as a published author there's stuff you don't get you know then mm. you you know, see people getting you know their books translated into 30 languages and they're like, oh but you know it, not everything happens at once for everybody it's just like a it's like any career isn't it it's like you know highs and lows and um you just got to keep going well we're glad that you did keep going because we uh, love this book and can't can't wait to hear more so louise Hare, whose latest book is miss aldridge regrets thanks for joining me today thank you so we've covered two books. I hope you're liking the new uh, extra feature as well with the five and five. Let me know. Let me know if it works for you or not. Um, always good to know. Now, who knew 
that M.W. Craven had come up with another book so early. He's got the next one, The Botanist, I believe, coming out. I'm saying June. That, that's what my brain is telling me. Let's hope that's right. So when I saw him um, with a photo saying, here am I signing my new books. You can order them now. I was like, what? What's, what's going on? Excuse me? A new book about Washington Poe and Tilly Bradshaw? I'm in. And it's a short book. It's about 130 pages. And it's part of the Quick Reads um, publications. And these are great books for someone, whether you're a proficient reader and you're just maybe got in a rut of not being able to read or focus and you need something shorter to take your, you know, to really captivate you. Maybe you know someone who's not really done a lot of reading recently or read many books at all. I think these series, these quick read series are phenomenal. And I'm thinking actually I'm going to make this a bit of a feature for the next few weeks because there's some really good books that have come out that that are great. And there's nothing wrong with a shorter book. I have the sense of accomplishment when you finish it. And the great thing about this one is that it's not as it's not that you read a short book and you thought, well, that was nice, but it was missing this, it was missing that. He's got everything. It's got the mystery. It's got the great dynamics of Poe and, and Tilly. Um yeah, okay. Well, here's the blurb. Hanging from a hook in a meatpacking plant isn't how Washington Poe wants to spend his weekend. He's been punched and kicked, and when the pale man arrives, it seems things will go soon from bad to worse. The pale man is a contract killer, and he and his razor are feared all over London. But Poe knows two things the pale man doesn't, and now things are about to get interesting. Let's do first sentence. <laughs> it started with an old lady. And my copy's signed. I was so thrilled to be able to um, buy a copy that Mike had taken a photo of him signing. But these books are a pound each. I mean, that's amazing. You can get them on the Kindle, but you can get a print, a printed book in this day and age with the price of paper for a pound. That's amazing. So I, yeah, I thought that was great. And it's made me even more excited for the, the botanist when that comes out. Now, the next book is something, it's written by this organisation called Simple Politics. Now, I follow them, so I presume that everyone knows about them, and you may not. What they do is just drill down what's going on and just give you bullet points, facts. Um, so it's very independent, I feel, um, and particularly through the years of the pandemic, I know we're still there, I'm not saying it's over, um, it, they were very helpful to me, I thought. And then I saw them advertising this book and I was like, oh, yes, please, I'm in for this. First of all, because I wanted to support them. And secondly, because it just sounded something interesting. So, yes, this is all about the pandemic. So if if that's going to set you off on a journey you don't want to go down to, that's fine. Um, but here's the blurb. Dear lovely people, to say it's been quite a couple of years doesn't really cut it. We're damaged both physically and mentally. We've suffered fear, loss, boredom, pain, illness and anxiety. Maybe some snatched moments of joy, we hope. It's been our honour and an absolute privilege to walk alongside you throughout this quagmire. Simple Politics never set out to communicate virus-related restrictions. In 2015, it was very much more focused on how the House of Lords works and debates on the voting age. The best laid plans, eh? With over 3,000 posts in the two-year period, 160 briefings covered and 400 posts on restrictions, we hope we've been useful. We hope we've been here when you needed us. We hope we've helped. Also, maybe, that we raised a smile now and again. Over the next few pages, you can relive the highs and the lows, the ebb and flows of restrictions. Stare unbelievably at the somehow forgotten bleakness of it all. Remember those moments of hope, peace and love, team simple politics. So I'm not going to read it because there is, it is factual, but basically each page is a different day. So the first page is uh, something that they posted the 23rd of January and then it goes on March. It's not every single day, but it's a lot of days. And I found this incredibly helpful because it it makes you reflect. I know we've thought about it. Obviously, I've thought about it, but it made me reflect and just think, 
yeah, we we have been through. I'm allowed to feel how I feel because of all of this that we've been through. It's extraordinary. And if someone had started at the beginning and said, right, these are all the changes in rules and regulations that you're going to experience over the next 18 months, two years, certainly my brain would have said, I cannot, I cannot comprehend all these changes and what's going on. And yet this happened. We went through this. And I think this book is phenomenal. Um, I believe they're doing another print run. I don't know how long it will be available. So do have a look. Certainly I follow them on on Instagram, um, but they're simple politics. And I, I thought it's not a book I'm going to give to people as a gift, because I think it's down to you and your own judgment of how comfortable you would be reading through what's happened. But for me... Yeah, I found it really, really helpful. Excellent. And so we come on to the last book. And this is How to Kill Your Family by Bella Mackey. It's now in paperback. Um, BBC Sounds have also got it as one of their, well, I call it a dramatised book. It, yes, the narrator it brings a lot of drama to it and they do condense the story. But at the heart of it, it is the story, the, the book. Let's do the blurb, which is very to the point. And here, we, here it is. Kill my family, make a claim on their fortune, get away with the above, adopt a dog. Meet Grace Bernard, daughter, sister, colleague, friend, serial killer. Grace has lost everything and now she wants revenge. Um, and let's do the beginnings. Uh, there's a prologue, but I'm going to do chapter one. I step off the plane and encounter that glorious blast of hot air that British people always dramatically exclaim at when they land somewhere hot and remember that much of the rest of the world enjoys a climate which doesn't just fear between grey and cold. Uh, now, this book, I have seen this for a long time. I thought the title was intriguing. It's got a good cover. I thought that sounds good. But I held back because I thought, oh, either I'm going to love this book or I'm really going to hate it. And I didn't want to, nobody wants to hate a book, do they? So it was with some trepidation that I first dipped my toe in with the BBC Sounds. And I've used that before to judge whether I might like a book and then to read the book itself. Now, if you're no good with a book that is slightly, well, when I say tongue in cheek, it's written, I found it quite funny, but it's not funny. Um... But I think you need a certain sense, dark sense of humour. You need to be dark and twisted like me. I really enjoyed it. It's different. And that's what I keep banging on about. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know all the stories. I love what happened. And uh, yeah, great. So as long as you don't want something very sort of bland and um, just pure primary colours, then I think you would really enjoy this book. And I'd commend listening to it first on the BB Sounds app just to see if it's the sort of thing that you would get on with and then getting the book because uh, it's it's glorious in its awfulness. And I don't mean the, the writing's awful, it's just all that happens. Wow, it, I won't forget it in, in a hurry, that's for sure. But I think I've delivered you quite a range of books. I've also realised that I say the word so approximately three billion times. So I'm going to say, so I apologise for saying so. But anyway, there we are. But you've had a range of books. You've had non-fiction, fiction, all really good ones, but for very different reasons. So we had Louise Hare on, who came to talk to us about Miss Aldridge Regrets, a great fiction murder mystery book. Um, we've had Stuart Lawrence, um, who is, Steve, well, I should say the Honourable Stuart Lawrence, who is Stephen Lawrence's brother and his book is called silence is not an option find your voice and be your best self phenomenal um, then we've had the cutting season by mw craven loved that book then we had two years indoors by simple politics that i'm very very glad i read that book and then how to kill your family by bella mackey a superb book so there we go hopefully something's picture picture what's it and um just happy reading and I'll look forward to talking to you again next week so look after yourselves and I'll see you very soon take care now bye-bye you've been listening to the quick book reviews podcast that's enough books said no one ever 
see you again soon.